Amen. Thank you for that. Well, if you need a handout tonight for the one of the handouts for the top 10 ways to ruin your children, if you would raise your hand, the ushers will come and give you one. Also, they can provide for you tonight a prayer sheet. There's some up here, men, um, who could use a handout right there in the back over there. Just keep that hand up. They'll bring you one so you don't miss out on these notes tonight. As we continue in our series, the top 10 ways to ruin your children. Again, like I mentioned last week, if your Bible's open to Psalm 127, how did I find these top 10 ways? Well, I just looked at what I do with my kids and wrote them down in one afternoon and said, oh boy, I'm in trouble. But we're sure uh, glad for the Word of God to help uh, guide us as we train up our children. Now, I realize that some of you don't have children. Some of you used to have young children, and some of you never want to have children. Well, as we look at the Word of God, I think it'll be a help. You may know someone who has kids, and maybe these, these lessons will be a help. You can point them to the, to the YouTube channel after the fact and say, listen, uh, my pastor did some things. Maybe this will be a help to you in, uh, in your family. And I hope it's along the way a help to you as well. Now, I thought tonight the, uh, the sound guys did a great job so far, didn't you? Say amen. Did they do a good job so far? And boy, nothing like throwing some new things at them at a moment's notice, and I appreciate them doing that. And we just have a great staff here and help volunteer base here at First Baptist Church. I was so thankful for the turnout, for the um, for the soul winning conference, and just for through Easter, the egg hunt, and all those things. We we're commenting today in staff meeting about what a great church. The, the, us, the staff guys, we're, what a great church we get to serve at where so many people are willing to serve alongside in this church. And in many churches, it's the same people that do everything, but it doesn't seem that way at First Baptist Church. It seems that not anyone does everything, all right, but we have so many people across this auditorium in this church, those are the ministries tonight, who are willing to serve the Lord, and I thank you for that. Boy, I can't say thank you enough as we see the work of the Lord go forward as we try to further his kingdom. All right, this is not for First Baptist Church, it's for Jesus, and that's what we're serving for. But I appreciate tonight, especially the, the technical side of things. And uh, they often, uh, having done sound at an early age in my life and, and loving the sound system, uh, sound guys often get the short end of the stick. All right, it's just w- what happens, and I appreciate them, what they do. And so do the live stream guys. Now, we don't see that as much when you're watching live stream. If anything happens with live stream, it is obviously somebody sitting in a booth. All right, it is their fault. Right? And so quick to text, hey, what about this? Now, sometimes it is our fault. We want to correct all those things, and we don't mind the feedback in any way, shape, or form. We recently upgraded our live stream service and uh, just thought it was the right thing to do. So if you're at home watching, and if you watch live stream now, I would encourage you to go through the website itself to fbc.com, I think, slash live. Or on that front page, it'll, it'll uh, direct you to where to go. If you watch through the website itself, our new service will actually tailor the stream to meet your internet needs. And so if you have a slower internet, it will make it seamless for you. And if you have a faster one, it'll, it'll up it so you never buffer. And hopefully that'll make a more seamless experience if you can't be with us live here. So just some things we're trying to, to be the best we can for uh, furthering the kingdom of God. But we're looking forward tonight as we look at the, the next one, the number two, on top ten ways to ruin your children. If you have your Bibles, in Psalm 127, verses 3 and 4, the Bible says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Lord, I pray you'd help us tonight. Lord, give me the strength and grace and help that I need. Lord, may our hearts be open to your truth from your word. Lord, would you challenge us and convict us and help us to change uh, when we see it in your word. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. Now I want you to remember, and I will not go through all the, the lessons from last week. If you have your notes, it will be on the last page tonight, on the last page. But just to remind you of four kind of over, overruling uh, guiding principles for us, four things about children, I want you to remember that number one, and this is not on your notes, just to listen and remember this, we'll go over these probably about every week. Very few people are trying to ruin their children. Very few people are trying to ruin their children. I remember when this thought struck me a few years back, that boy, that kid is terrible. It's my kid. No, I'm not trying to ruin them, but if I'm not careful, I will. But few people set out to ruin their children. Number two, we are all going to make mistakes. If being a perfect parent is what it takes to have a perfect child, then there will be no perfect children in the world. 
And I would remind you that we did have a perfect parent at one point. His name was God the Father, and Adam and Eve still sinned. It was not God's fault. I'm not making excuse for us as parents. I'm just saying we are going to make mistakes. Number three, we must realize tendencies and attitudes that don't please the Lord and make corrections. It's not enough just to sit in here or read the Word of God or some other influence, iron sharpened iron, and to say, oh, yeah, that's a problem. It's not enough just to identify the issue. We're supposed to make corrections based on the Word of God with the strength of God. I'm not just saying this just so you can identify uh, tendencies and attitudes in your spouse or your neighbor or someone in your section. Oh, I hope they're listening to this right here. They really need that. This is for me, for you. And last, the fourth guiding principle for us, God's, God's word brings practical truth and help to our parenting. God's word brings practical truth and help to us as parents. That means that we can go to the word of God in each of these lessons, each of these principles, these top ways, 10 ways, I will have some deceptive thoughts and then some correct thinking. And under that correct thinking, there will be at least one Bible passage for you to identify and say, okay, this is what pastor is gaining this concept from. Not just making it up, not just some self-help, trying to gain these principles and truths from the word of God. Fair enough? Well, that's where we're going tonight um, in each of these weeks. Notice that sometimes I will step on your toes. All right, last week I was talking about cell phones. And a number of comments encouraging me to continue on preaching against cell phones. Lance just dropped the shoulders, like, unbelievable. So I was going to do principle number two, but I thought I'd just do a whole one on cell phones tonight. No, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Brother Mark. Um, listen, I'm going to meddle sometimes, and that's all right. I will tell you when I'm meddling, and if I just give you some advice, some practical advice along the way, and I do not take the cell phone thing from the Word of God, I take it from experience in the school, an experience with teenagers and 12 years as principal, four years as youth pastor. It's funny, interesting, odd to me that uh, two people that I know, myself being one of them and Brother Danny Goldemez, current principal, who are both, by other standards, well-established in technology. I would not be a novice in technology. In fact, one time I had a job offered to me in technology. I was dating my wife. Uh, it was, we were engaged at this point. We were at a department store. We were doing this registry. And it was not working at the department store. And somehow I talked the lady into letting me troubleshoot the computer system. I don't know how I did that or remember what I asked. She let me do this. And there was a phone in there. And I picked up the phone and I got connected to someone in Chicago. I don't know, again, how they let me do this or why. Now I'm talking to this, to this IT person in Chicago, and I said, hey, there's a problem with your computer system, registry system here. My, wife, my fiance and I are trying to register. She goes, oh, okay. And for some reason, she begins to talk to me about troubleshooting the system. She goes, well, try this. I said, I already did that. And I did this, this, and this. And she goes, you know what? You've done everything that, that we would have done here. Do you want a job? I'll hire you right now. <laughs> right, honey? I mean, that's what? I said, well, no, I love my job. I'm a youth pastor. I said, well, how much do you pay? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> Fairly handy in technology. I've taken classes for it, some certifications in it. But the Goldman is very, very excellent on a computer. It's, it's odd to me that the two of us, and there's others in this same category who know technology very well, are the ones that want to steer young people away from it. It seems the ones who don't have a clue, parents, want to stay locked into it. They're the ones that come and say, well, well, I will check everything. I know. Okay. Okay. Over the years, it's been some of those same parents who come back. Well, what do I do now? Here's what you do. Oh, that's going to cost me money. Yes, it is. Oh, I can't pay that. So sometimes I will meddle. Will you forgive me for that? I'm not asking forgiveness, so you don't have to. Don't worry. Tonight, let's go to number two tonight, though, as we look at top ten ways to ruin your children. Principle number one, all right, and I'll give you this one. Principle number one, if you want to ruin your kids, then just raise moral, character-driven, nice kids. That was on that, uh, that first page of your notes. And uh, just if you want a Bible example of that, that would be, I would say, Saul, or a, a good idea would be Saul and David. Saul was a good kid. Saul was a humble kid. King Saul, right? 
ended up not being a godly child. David was a man after God's own heart. Right? There's a difference. But tonight, number two in the last page of your notes in the back there, if you want to ruin your kids, then teach them to pick and choose when to follow authority. If you want to ruin your kids, teach them to pick and to choose when to follow authority. This could have been number one, but I thought number one ought to be number one. This is a damaging, damaging, damaging idea. I have unfortunately seen it time after time, year after year. I would submit that this idea is one of the most deadly attitudes, most deadly philosophies, most dangerous philosophies that you can infect your children with. Teaching them to pick and to choose when to follow authority. Now, I'm going to give some qualifications because some of you will sit there and think like this. Aha, so you're saying that if the teacher says to do that, they always do that. And so if they say to kill their fellow student, they should kill their fellow student. Some of you will sit there and think like that. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. As as the, the apostle said, for we ought to obey God rather than man. But God teaches us about authority. I would, I would suggest, I would submit that there are three levels, not three levels, but three ways that you and I have authority in our life right now. We have civil authority. We have civil authority. When we go out and about, we are under a government, right, a government, like it or hate it, for it or against it, you live in a place with civil authority. You are not allowed to do just what you want to do or how you feel without some consequences attached to those decisions, right? There's, there's a civil authority that we are all under. This includes a political realm. This includes a policing realm. Uh, this includes places we go. Also in the civil idea of authority, this would include our jobs and our employers. Civil authority. When you go to work, Unless you own the joint, you have some authority over you, right? They often tell you when to come and when to leave. Along with that, they're very demanding these places of employment. They often, if not always, have dress requirements. Can you believe that? If you get a job at Walmart, you're not allowed to wear a, 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 a Target shirt. Just try it and see how long you'll be employed at Walmart. You say, well, my place doesn't have any kind of dress requirements. Well, fine. Don't wear anything tomorrow. (laughs) I'm not trying to be crude, but, but everywhere we go, there are requirements. There's authority. Someone said it this way, everyone in authority is under authority. There is always authority in my life and in your life. We have general interactions. You know, when you go to the store, there's still authority at the store. Can you believe that? They make you check out where they want you to check out. And if they don't want to have anyone at the cashier, they make you do self-checkout. And if you don't want to do self-checkout, sometimes you don't have a choice. Well, I'm going to check out right here. Sorry, sir. Sorry, ma'am. That register is closed. Well, it's not closed. I don't want it to be closed. I just opened it. How far does that get you? Well, I just won't check out in. I'll just leave with my stuff. We're all under authority. And the first level is a civil authority that we operate in every single day. We also operate, many of us operate, in a school situation. Students, you have school authority. Well, you know that. Teachers tell you when to sit down, where to sit down, how long to sit down. Unbelievable. It's like, it's like prison away from home almost. And then we have church. Do you know we still have, in a sense, rules at church? 
right? So like, so like as a pastor, I get to speak, and if like other people started coming over and just talking, we probably would stop that, right? You know, if someone came in the back and like, you know what, I'm not a member, I've never been here, but I want to say something right now. There are some men and some ladies in this place who'd be like, you know what, we like you, we love you, God loves you, Jesus died for you, but you don't get to talk right now. Yes or no, right? Uh, e- even in a church situation. Well, you know what? I want to work in the nursery. Well, you can't. Right? There are things along the way. We always have authority in our life. I'm just painting the ground. Please and please learn about this idea tonight about how we cannot just pick and choose when to follow authority. It damages homes, it damages minds, and it damages future relationships, including a child's relationship with God. What does this look like when we teach them to pick and to choose when to follow authority? Well, sometimes and often it looks like this, speaking badly of authority when you disagree with it. That's not in your notes, but you can write that down. Speaking badly of authority when you disagree with it. Now, there is a difference between teaching and training and ridiculing and running down authority. Now, let me meddle a little bit here. You may not like our current president, but you can still teach your children to have respect toward authority. You can say things like, well, I didn't vote for him. That's fine. That's fine. You can say, well, child A, child B, here's why I disagree with this policy. That's fine, too. I would encourage you to bring the Bible to the conversation. All right? But to run a political figure down, all right, to lambast them, to ridicule them, is to teach your children to pick and choose when to follow and respect authority. You say, no, that's different, Pastor Al. That is different, different, different. No, it's not. No, it's not. I was taught certain things growing up, and I do my best to refer to, the, to someone in a position by their position. So I refer to President Biden as President Biden. Some of you will say, well, he'll never be my president. Well, I'm sorry, but as a citizen of the United States, he is. Right? Just, just legally, it's how that works, just so you know, until you change citizenship. Again, I'm meddling a little bit here. But this is what that looks like. Let me bring it a little closer to home. Now your kids are in school. And their teacher got after them. And they came home and complained to mommy. I don't know who I'm pointing at all all y'all right now, all y'all. Mommy gets fired up. Mommy gets fired up. Mama Bear, I call her. Remember the first time I met a Mama Bear in my office as principal? Mama Bear's swinging away. She's growling away. She's swinging for the jugular vein at me. I was not part of the situation or part of the problem or part of the solution. I remember kind of like out-of-body experience, like, whoa, this person's really upset at me right now. And I thought, wait a second, they're not upset at me. They're fighting for their child. That day they were completely incorrect about the situation. They had believed everything their child had said. I remember what Pastor Lett used to say, what a, what a powerful statement. He said, we will agree not to believe everything your kids say about you if you don't believe everything they tell you about us. Now listen, we have stories in the classroom. Was it Mark? I think it was you, Mark, whose daughter in class said, pray for my daddy, he drinks the bad drink. <laughs> and he was drinking energy drinks, the Red Bull, right? Was that what it was? Or was it energy drinks? The Arizona iced tea, even worse. Yeah. Pray for my daddy, he drinks the bad. Now, you just take that statement of face value. He drinks the bad drink. Where are we going to go as a staff? Oh, Brother Mark. Well, Brother Mark, we had talked to you about alcohol, my friend. Right? Come on now. So, listen, your, your, your child gets in trouble at school. Before you jump off the handle and say, you know what, I'll tell you what about that teacher. I never liked them in the first place. They've had it out for you and for me and for your brother and for your sister and for, and for everyone. In fact, they'd have it out for Jesus if he was in school. I'm going to call them right now and give them a piece of my mind. Before you do that, 
Would you maybe just maybe think about this principle? Just think about it. And then as you, and, and okay, there are times when we will make mistakes in a school. No doubt about it. There are times as teachers that we will see it in, a situation incorrectly. All right, there are times, young people, that we will even get after you and you didn't do a blooming thing. All right, there are times that will happen. Now, there are more times that you'll get away with something. All right, you know that and I know that. There are times that you won't be doing something and they'll be like, Brayden, stop talking right now. You're like, I wasn't talking. I was sleeping, but I wasn't talking. But parents, if you want to emphasize to pick and choose authority, then just run down authority in your kid's life. Just run them down. Make statements like this. Well, we're supposed to do this, but that's stupid. Yeah, they said we should do this, but psh, what do they know? <laughs> dumb school, dumb church, dumb president. If you want to teach your kids to pick and choose when to follow authority, then steamroll any authority that gets after your kid. Now, we see this on the news. They get broad, right? You see this on the news. A police officer, authority, will try to intercept a situation. And all of a sudden, when they're trying to maybe pause something that maybe needs correction, everyone steamrolls that authority. Parents, you do this as well. Well, my baby, my baby child, oh, oh, you know what? I'll solve it. I'll solve it. I'll get out my bazooka and my steamroller. Problem over. Lawn mower parenting, you mow down every obstacle. You teach your children that just call mom and dad. You act just one side. Remember one time a parent was upset in the school. Thankfully, after 12 years, they have plenty of stories without names. So thinking people can remain innocent. They said, Well, my child wouldn't lie to me, they have a pretty good head on their shoulders. Absolutely. Absolutely. Your child. Will, what do you say to that? What do you say? There's no answer to that. I am not foolish enough to think that Johnny, James, or Daniel won't lie to me. I bet they will sometimes. I would hope they wouldn't lie to me. All right, that's fair, right? But do you think they're always going to tell me the truth every single time? Boy, I hope so. But I'm not foolish enough to believe that. If you are, then I still have some beachfront property in Arizona, miles and miles of sand. Great deal for you. Let me give you some deceptive thoughts there in your notes there. Deceptive thought that it's okay to only follow authority when you understand it. This is where this idea comes from. I only have to follow authority if I understand it. If it, if it makes sense and if I understand it, then I'll follow it. If it doesn't make sense, and it looks stupid to me, then I don't have to follow it. If I don't view uh, what you're saying to make any sense to me, I don't understand the context or anything, then you know what? Forget you. I won't follow it. Number two, it's okay to only follow authority when you agree with it. If I see your viewpoint and I think it's valid and I think it's right, then great, I do it. If I don't agree with it, if I don't see what's wrong with what you're asking me, then I won't do it. Years ago, we had a parent who had a rule in a school. We had a rule in a school that a parent told their child differently on. They said, no, no, you can do this, that the rule said you can't do this. I called that situation, called the parent, and said, listen, child can't do that. And the parent responded, well, I'm the parent, and I told them they could. Like, that was supposed to end the conversation. It actually just began the conversation. They said, well, that is true, you are the parent. And that is true, you can tell them to do that. But what is not true is that they can do it and you still be a parent of a student here. All right? They can do that all day long. Right? And there's a, there's a school for that, it's called homeschooling. And you can do that, no, no problem. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not arguing the validity of the rule or not the rule, but it is the rule. And they wanted to choose, pick and choose because they didn't see what was wrong with the situation. They said, well, but I pay money for my kids to come to school here. 
I said, you do. They wanted to continue the conversation. I said, you do. But coming to school here is not an inalienable right. It is a privilege. And consequently, as a privilege, as principal, I'm allowed to expel any student. Conversation got a lot slower then. I'm not trying to be mean or a jerk, but what we're, we're teaching our kids to pick and choose when we only do what we agree with. Make sense? I went to Bob Jones University. Big old rule book there. Big old rule book. You know, there are some things that I did not agree with at the university. Can you believe that? I did not every night pray over the university handbook. I didn't pray over it. I barely looked at it. It was pointed out to me at certain times, different things in there that I had, should have looked at a little more closely. I didn't agree with everything they asked me to do, but I did agree to abide by it when I went there. I had some, some fellow classmates who would complain about the rules. Well, this one's stupid. I don't see where the Bible says you have to. Well, no, no. Sometimes in an institution, you have logistical rules. Come in through this door, go through this door. Why? So we can flow correctly. I said, you agreed to come here and do it. Oh. Number three, deceptive thought. It's okay to only follow authority when you see the purpose in it. If I can go back to the school situation, sometimes parents say, listen, you know what? Don't worry about that assignment. I don't see any value in it. Well, that's why we hire teachers who are trained. And that's why you've asked us to help educate your child. It's a, it's a partnership. I don't see the value in that. Who needs to know math anyway? Who needs to know English? One time we did have a student ask, when am I ever going to use this again? Hopefully the rest of your life in America. A couple problems that you'll encounter along the way. If you follow this philosophy, if you choose your children, if you teach your children to pick and choose, number one, your children will pick, on, pick up on what you do more than what you say. They will pick up more on what you do than what you say. Way back, early days, his principal, dad called in. Pastor JD, yes, sir. I want to give you some advice on how to help the school be better. All for it, any day of the week. Proceeded to say we should do this, 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 and this. Something's helpful. And then went on to say that the reason their child was no longer part of any ministry was because the school ruined them. Wanted some advice for us. Fair enough. What he did not realize is that I knew a whole lot more to the situation than he knew I knew. And how he was actively trying or undermining the rules pretty much every day of the week. Along the way, found out that this, his child was involved in just a lot of sinful things against school rules, authority. No big deal, laughed it all off. It's no surprise, is it? Another family found out school got done. We ask our children, uh, our students here, not to go to the movie theater. It's one of the rules we have. I'm not arguing for or against it right now. I'm just stating what, what one of the rules we have. Found out when uh, they graduated that, you know what, They're, they'd been allowed to go every single weekend. Every single weekend. No surprise. No surprise. If I told you where the kids are at now. The kids will pick up on a whole lot more what you do than what you say. I promise you this. I promise you they will pick up on what you do more than what you say. So you can say, obey and follow, and you do the opposite, they'll pick up on that. Number two, the second problem, your children will pick and choose when to follow you. I have seen this time and time again. Parents establish a pattern, running down authority, rejecting authority, whether it be civil, church, or school, rejecting that, running them down. And the day they come in and say, Pastor, do you have a problem? Pastor, I have a problem. My child thinks that I'm an idiot, basically. And now the child is running down their parents. And now when the parent says, do this, the child now says, I don't think so. They've been taught to just pick and choose, 
and they will apply that to you as a parent, I promise you. They will put you under the same, the same um, litmus test that you've done everywhere else, the same standard. They'll do the same thing to you. I, I promise you, I've seen it. I guarantee it. You teach them that way, they'll, they'll pick and choose from you. And that's when parents say, no, 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 no. You can't pick and choose what I tell you to do. No, 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 no. I help you when to pick and choose, but everything I say you have to do. You won't have that luxury. You will not have that luxury. The last problem, I think the greatest problem, is eventually the children will pick and choose, ultimately pick and choose, when to follow God. The reason we, don't, we want them to follow authority and, and be submissive, because I want my children to be submissive to the Lord. I want them to follow him even when it doesn't make sense, even when they don't agree, and even when they don't see the purpose behind it. I want my kids to follow God. Let me give you the correct response briefly tonight. Correct response. Hebrews 13, verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you. See that in your notes? Look at that. Submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. The Bible teaches us obedience. That little blank there in your sheet, teach obedience and model it. Teach obedience and model it. Again, if you sit there and say, well, what if they say this anti-biblical? I'm not talking about that. We'll get into that maybe just a little bit. Teach obedience. What does obedience look like? I'm talking now to, to parents of all ages, but specifically young ages. Three things. Here's obedience. Ready? Right away with the right answer and the right attitude. That's obedience. All right, right away. Hey, go clean your room. Right away. Should start moving toward their room. Not when they feel like it. Right, not when they get around to it. Not after next Christmas. Not when it fits in their schedule, but right away. With the right answer. In your home, maybe you permit, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, whatever. Whatever. I don't think you do. In our home, what we ask for is yes, ma'am, or yes, sir. That's what we ask for. We find it to be respectful with the right attitude. Normally when I ask my kids to do something, I'm not asking for their emotional status. James, how do you feel about cleaning your room? Are you feeling that right now? Is cleaning the room jiving in your world right now, dude? Because frankly... I don't care. Sorry, I do. Oh, oh yes, I care so much. I don't want to damage their psyche. I want them to feel, oh, no, no, no. I want their room cleaned. Trash needs to go to the curb. It's Wednesday morning. Kids, take out the trash. Oh, dad, trash. Dad. I don't care how you feel. I want you to do what I'm asking you to do. Hopefully, that one day when the Lord asks them to do something by faith, that they do it right away, with the right answer. Yes, Lord. Speak, Lord. Right away, sir. Be glad to. With the right attitude. Right? We've seen Christians with the wrong attitude. Well, I'll give my tie to the Lord. Oh, I'm walking by faith today. Man, this faith journey is so heavy, it can barely hold up. No. Isn't it great having faith with God? He's asked me to to do this, and I have no clue what's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to work out. It makes no sense to me. I don't understand it. I don't see the purpose. And it looks like it's a horrible mistake, but God asked me to, and I'm all in. So teach obedience. We get this backwards, parents. Kids are young. We want to explain everything. Here's why I want you to do this. I called the grocery store grape illustration. Two-year-old grabs a grape out of the cart and pops it in their mouth. The mom says, okay, honey, you can't eat that grape. We haven't paid for them yet. If we don't pay for things, then that'll be stealing. We don't want to be, we don't want to be stealing if we steal. It's against the law. And then they, it's called shoplifting as well. He's two, he's chomping on this grape. And, and you don't want to be shoplifting. Then you have a, a record. And then if you keep on stealing in life, you go to jail. And, and you can't serve the Lord. You can't please God. And God talks about stealing. You shouldn't do that. It's sin. And so, buddy, you can't eat the grape. 
and at two we're going through a whole dialogue on why you can't eat a grape. Then a student becomes 15, 13, big an age in there. And now these, these young people have great questions. Hey, Dad, why do we do this? Well, why do we go to church three times a week? Dad, why do you ask me to say yes, sir? Good questions. Oh, why, why don't you let me do this over here? Good questions. And now at, at 15 and 13 or 16, instead of taking the time to explain the answer then, when we ought to be able to give a good answer and say, listen here, this is, what, this is why we do this. The Bible says this and God says this and your mom and I have done this. And here we go. Instead we say, listen, you know what? Because I said so, quit talking back to me, go to your room, take out your trash and clean your room, by the way, I don't care how you feel. We're at two. Don't eat the grape. Why? Because I said so. That's an acceptable answer. It's acceptable to say, because I said so. I don't have to explain, Johnny, don't play in the road right now. Why, Dad? Well, because you see their car, boom, car's coming. Because I said so. Sometimes God gives us reasons for why he asks us what to do. Right? A soft answer turneth away wrath. He teaches us in that, right? Other times, he just tells us what to do. And so, I believe when kids are young, teach them obedience quickly and model it. And don't get it back when they get old, explain, but still expect that. Parents, be an example. Be an example, parents, and grandparents right now, and people who are not parents yet. Be an example of someone who does things they don't want to do. Let me meddle just a little bit here. You realize they ask us to wear masks when we go into stores? You realize that? Anybody realize that? Now, they don't, they don't ask us to at church. They gave me that liberty. The governor gave me that liberty, and uh, I took full advantage of it. They asked us to at stores. Some people have asked me, well, well I'm not wearing one at a store. Or they told me, I'm not wearing one at a store. What are you teaching everybody else? I have to wear shoes when I go to a store. I have to wear a shirt. What? No shirt, no shoes, no service? Maybe you can just teach someone else what it's like to follow and submit. Even if you don't agree, understand or see the purpose. See how dangerous this philosophy is? See how dangerous? If I have to agree with everything, then you know, my life will be wonderful for me but not for anyone else. A few years back, I was here at the church, and a man walked in the church, a member of our church. He walked in wearing a pair of shorts. Now, I don't care if you wear a pair of shorts at church or not. Uh, pastor, for a lot of years, asked the staff, guys, not to wear shorts, all right? And um, the guy walked into church, and, and he knew that Pastor Led had, had asked the staff, guys, not to wear shorts. As far as I know, Pastor never asked church members not to wear shorts to church, but he walked in, and I was there, and he goes, huh, I'm wearing shorts. He said this. Pastor Let can't tell me what to do. I looked at him, did not engage. My mind was engaging. I will tell you how my mind engaged. I still remember to this day who it was, where I was, and what I thought. I thought, first of all, wow, you're a big man. You can wear shorts. Unbelievable. Number two, I thought, how sad. How sad that you can't even, and Pastor Let, as far as I know, never, never said a word about that, about people not wearing shorts, but, but I said, wow, how sad for you to live life that small, teaching to pick and choose. I had my motorcycle, still, pulled in Frankenmuth when the, when the uh, food trucks were there. Family was there, and I was riding over there at uh, 25 miles an hour. Pulled there next to the River Place, and there was all packed full of cars. There was one spot open, one spot open. I zipped right into the spot, jump off the bike, and then I see right in front of me was a specialty spot. Uh, they had these, these, these banners up, and they had a handicap sign hanging on this, on this uh, like one of those, uh, you know those little flags they use at car dealerships? That's what it was. They had a little handicap sign flapping there. I think, oh my goodness, I'm looking around. Handicap sign flapping. No other spots anywhere. The family's going to get food. I've got the money. And look right next to me, and there's a Frankenmuth police officer right there. He looks at me. I look at him. 
I said, is this really handicapped, their handicapped spot? He goes, well, here's the deal. I can't tell you this, but I will. He said, it's really not. It's not marked. In order to have a handicap, you have to be marked visually and with blue color, just so you know. Blue color and with a sign, signage. If you don't, don't have both of those things, if it's a yellow with a sign or no sign, it's not a true handicap spot. He said, really, it's, it's not a handicap spot. So I'm thinking, <laughs> but I'm fine. My family's there. I got money, hungry food trucks, bike. I don't see anything else. He said, would you do me a favor? Would you mind parking somewhere else? I'm processing at this point. I asked him, I said, so, so if I stay, you can't ticket me, can you? Uh, technically, no. I said, no problem. I got on my bike, put my helmet back on, so I could see him. <laughs> put my helmet back on and moved right around the lot, and the Lord opened up another spot for me. Now, listen, I don't always do, I'm, I'm not for a moment trying to tout myself as an ultimate example of this, all right? But I think back to that day, and I told the kids, and, and uh, I think somebody, either the kids or somebody else said, Dad, you should just stay there. It wasn't handicapped or something like that. I said, no, kids, he'd asked me to. I could move. It's a little thing. I didn't agree with it. I didn't understand it. And I didn't see the purpose in it. All right? But you know what? I can follow authority if I need to. I want my kids to. That last statement there, I desire to raise children who will follow God and the authority he has placed in their lives. Dangerous, dangerous idea to pick and choose when to follow authority. Dangerous, dangerous, deadly, infectious idea. You may have to adjust some things. You may have to fix some things. But I don't want kids, I don't want my kids to pick and choose when to follow God. I want them when God speaks, say, yes, sir. I'd be glad to. In fact, I was hoping you'd ask. In fact, I was just thinking, I'm too comfortable in this house. I'll sell everything and follow you. You know, in fact, the tent stakes went a little deep. I'll jump up after you, Abraham. And by the way, you want a negative biblical example? I'll give you one. I'll submit one to you. Solomon and Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the Bible says, after he became king, listened to the older counselors and rejected their instruction and followed the younger counselors and did what he wanted to do. I would submit that the reason Rehoboam did that was because he'd watched his father Solomon, who wrote the book of Proverbs about women and money and alcohol and all the deceitfulness of life. He watched his father Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, reject all of it. Solomon rejected it on money, rejected it on women, rejected it on drink. Read Ecclesiastes. All of that. And Rehoboam merely mimicked what his father had modeled for him. Not what he said, but what he modeled for him. Lord, help us as parents that we will please you. Lord, that we will model these things to our children in a way that they can follow. Lord, we ask you to work in their heart. In Jesus' name, amen.